Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship. Thank you all for being with us this morning. Uh, clearly, this is a little bit different. Thank you all for being flexible and rolling with it this morning. Um, I just wanted to remind you all, if you do need to head inside for a restroom, the front doors are open. Um, but as we get started this morning, I'm going to invite you all to stand as you're able. We have a few songs to get us going this morning. And let's just take a moment to pray together. Uh, dear God, thank you so much for this beautiful, sunny day. Uh, I pray that everyone here is just able to take a moment out of their busy schedule and just uh, come together as a community and worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.
keep my eyes above the waves when oceans arise my soul will rest in your embrace for i Maybe seated. Whew, boy, that's bright. Oh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Church Outdoors. It's great that we get to do this. I actually uh, got the idea from uh, a colleague of mine back in the Midwest, and they were advertising church in their parking lot. And I was trying to figure out why they would do that, and I talked to him, and he said they just like the opportunity to get outside during the summer in the mornings when in the Midwest it's a little nicer than by 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, our reason for being outside is, uh, is not as, uh, uh, well, it was forced. They're painting the floor in the auditorium, and so they said we couldn't be in there this week. And I was like, well, what are we going to do? We could do it in the commons, but that just seems not as much fun. And so we decided, hey, we're going to get donuts, we're going to have coffee and juice, and we're just going to come outside and worship together. And God has blessed us with a fantastic day. I was a little nervous this week because we had a few mornings that started out gray and cloudy until about 11 o'clock, but... What a great day God has blessed us with. In fact, dare I say, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you. That was good. Uh, a reading this morning, as we are concluding our walk through the book of Ephesians, comes from one of uh, Paul's other letters in Romans chapter 8. And Paul talks about suffering, and he talks about future glory, present suffering and future glory. But then he talks at the end of this about prayer as well. Prayer is a little bit about what we are talking about today as we conclude our discussion on spiritual warfare. And in Ephesians, I'm sorry, in Romans, Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse uh, 18, Paul writes, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly, for our adoption to sonship and the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Prayer is one of those things that for some, it comes easy. Some of you are fantastic prayer warriors, and you spend a lot of time in prayer. For others, it's a challenge. It's a difficulty to know even what to pray. And yet the encouragement that Paul gives us is that even when we don't know what to say, the Spirit will help us to pray. The Spirit will pray through us and encourage us to do that. Not because God needs our prayers, but because it is what connects us to our Heavenly Father. A reminder that when we come to him in prayer, we are putting him as the Lord of our lives and the Lord of all things, and we recognize our dependence upon him, and we connect to him. And so that's what we're going to do right now, is we're going to take just a moment to pray. I'm going to invite you to bow your heads, and we're just going to lift up a few prayers this morning just for our community, for our neighbors, for our families, and our friends as we come before God. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we are gathered out here today, we are so thankful. We are so thankful, Lord, that even though our normal place of worship is not available to us today, you've provided another place and another opportunity. 
We thank you, Lord, for the beautiful weather that we have today and this chance that we have to gather together to continue to fellowship and to praise your name. Lord, we are so grateful for all of the goodness that you pour out into our lives and for the way that you work through us to share your gospel, Lord, among the communities and the neighborhoods where we live and where we work and where we play. We thank you, Lord, that you partner with us and you use us for your good work. But Lord, we also come recognizing this world that we live in is broken by sin. We see the marks of it all around us through the pain and the suffering of our family and our friends, of our neighbors and our communities. We see it in the, na- in the nations where wars exist. We see it, Lord, in our towns and our cities where crime and wickedness affect the population. We see it in the brokenness of those who are homeless or battle with mental illness or disease. Lord, we see it in the brokenness that exists in families and relation- in relationships. And Lord, we come today praying for your hand and your presence to invade our, pla- our, our nation and our world. Lord, you created this place to be good and you placed us in it so that we might live good lives. And yet, Lord, through the actions of our hands, through the words of our mouth, Lord, we have broken this place that you created for us. And so we pray, Lord, that you would pour your presence out upon this world. Lord, where there is sickness and illness and disease, we pray that you would bring healing for those who are struggling with illness, for those who are battling cancer, for those who are battling chronic diseases and illnesses. Lord, we pray for your hand of healing upon them. We pray for your peace and your comfort to be with them. We pray for your strength. Lord, for those who are facing surgery, we pray, Lord, for wisdom for doctors and nurses. We pray, Lord, that the surgeons would would be skillful and adept in the work that they do. And we pray for quick recoveries. Lord, we pray for those who battle with addiction. Lord, we pray that you would break those chains of bondage and you would bring freedom. Whether that's alcohol, whether that's drugs, whether that's uh, something else, whether it's, it's, it's gambling or, uh, or whether it's through lusts, Lord, whatever those things are, Lord, we pray for your, uh, your freedom from those addictions that hold people in bondage to sin. And Lord, where strife exists, where wars exist. Lord, we pray that you would bring peace. We pray that you would bring peace before conflicting nations. Lord, we pray that you would bring peace in our communities and in our neighborhoods. And Lord, we pray that you would bring peace in our families. Lord, we see all of this all around us. And Lord, we grieve even as we participate. Lord, forgive us for our sins. Wash us clean by the blood of Christ who went to the cross in our place and on our behalf. Make us once again that new creation, Lord, that we are through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We lift all of these prayers up to him, praying together as he has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
of God and man, you are high and lifted up, and hold the world will praise your great name, your great name, All right, well, just a couple of announcements that I want to make today. Just a reminder that in two weeks, we have our joint worship service with Grace Lutheran Church in Longview and uh, Church Picnic. Uh, that's in two weeks up in Woodland. We're going to be gathering at Horseshoe Lake. Uh, service time is going to be at 1030. I would recommend that if you are able to get there a little bit earlier than that, I would do so simply because uh, I've noticed that in the good weather, we are in the morning, but in the good weather, Horseshoe Lake fills up. So I'm not sure exactly what the uh, parking situation is going to end up being, but uh, we will be starting worship at 1030. Uh, we'll be doing a joint service, so I will be leading a service for both churches. We will have uh, some songs from our worship team. Uh, we'll have a couple of classic hymns played by the organist at, uh, at uh, Grace. Um, and we're just uh, looking for this, uh, looking forward to this great opportunity to worship together. This is a potluck picnic. We are going to have uh, hot dogs and uh, hamburgers available uh, for you. And we would just invite you to bring uh, bring some side dishes to go along, fruit, salads, desserts, whatever you'd like uh, to share with a group. Um, and this is a great opportunity too. If you want to invite someone along, invite them to come along with you. This is church in a in a non traditional way. You know, we get to do it in a way that isn't like stepping into a church building. So if there's someone that you know who might be open to this, even if they're not open to coming on Sunday, uh, invite them to come along and to join us. Uh, it's going to be a good time. In addition, uh, next Sunday, I will, be, uh, I will be in Milwaukee for Synod Convention. Every three years, uh, the, uh, our, our church body as a whole gets together uh, to decide on stuff. Uh, I've been reading through the resolutions. There is a lot of wrangling that seems to go on over uh, matters that I'm not entirely sure uh, deserve a lot of wrangling. But uh, this is how our church uh, walks together. Synod uh, is a word that a lot of people are not familiar with, but it simply means walking together. And this is what we are as a church body. Uh, Christ community is char a part of a, uh, of a congregational affiliation of churches. And what that means is every church is independent. We are an independent congregation who has chosen to affiliate with the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and to be part upholding the confessional standards, upholding the, uh, the, the beliefs and the practices of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, and we walk together with hundreds of congregations all around the United States. Uh, and so we are going, uh, I'm going as our representative for our circuit, which is the churches that exist in uh, Longview, uh, Clark County, and the northern part of Portland along the river. Um, I am the pastoral representative for them, which I'm realizing uh, is a great responsibility because I am not just going with what I think, but I'm representing this whole group together. Me and a lay representative from St. Matthew's down in Washougal. Uh, we'll be representing our circuit. Uh, so please be in prayer for me, be in prayer for our entire church body as we, uh, as we look to find harmony together, um, representing a church body that spans an entire nation. Uh, there are a lot of differences of opinions. Um, the Midwest is different than the coasts. It's different than the South. How we do ministry out here is very different from how we do ministry in the Midwest and trying to find room for all of that in one church body in agreement uh, continues to be a challenge and yet we are committed to walking together. So please be in prayer for, uh, for convention. It actually starts on Saturday and runs through the entire week. Um, so there's going to be a lot of discussion. Uh, be praying for Jennifer and I as we travel back to Milwaukee. Be praying for us as we are in Milwaukee in August, which I'm not looking forward to either. I'd rather this. Uh, the humidity level there is rather high. So Daniel Ferland from, uh, uh, from Grace will be coming and bringing the message last, uh, next week. You will remember him from a couple of months back. He came and preached while I was in California. Uh, did a great job. Love Daniel. He has been, uh, he has been a great uh, asset both at Grace and for our congregation as well. So he will be bringing the next, uh, message next week. So please be praying for him uh, as well. 
Uh, finally, we're going to be doing this again one more time as we get kicked out of the auditorium on August 13th. So uh, keep that date in your mind as well as we get together to worship outside uh, once again. Any other announcements that I need to make? Adrian, anything I'm leaving out that you know of? What's that? Ladies' Coffee, which in the, uh, in the newsletter said Thursday, July 25th. If you looked at the date, July 25th is actually a Tuesday, which is what it should be. Apparently, I mistyped when I was typing everything out. So Tuesday, July 25th, they're going to meet at Seasons Coffee at 1030. That's down at the Old Liberty Theater down in downtown uh, Ridgefield. Get some coffee and do a walk and talk around town. So uh, sounds like a great time as well. So be sure to be there for that. With that, I'm going to invite you to stand. Why don't you take a moment, get out of your tent, go to somebody else's tent and say good morning. All right, well, good morning, everyone. The day that you have been waiting for is finally here. After three months in Ephesians, we are at the finish line. This letter that we have been studying has covered a lot of ground. We spent five weeks in the beginning just on the topic of identity. And what I hope we all see is that identity has been a struggle, not just in our time, not just since Jesus, but going all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve were created as vessels for God's love. Their identity was rooted in the spirit of God that they shared when God breathed his spirit into Adam to bring him life. And then Eve was created out of Adam so that that same spirit would bring her life as well. And they were made in God's image. Both of those things are still with us. It's meant to be the core of our identity. But Adam and Eve rejected their created identity. And instead, they sought to create their own. This is what happened in the garden. From that moment, then, identity has been a battle. This isn't a new thing. When we look around and we see struggles with identity, with who we are, whether that's with sexual identity, whether that's with uh, identity through uh, what you do or, um, or, or your, your successes or whatever, this is not something that's new. This is something that's been going on right from the very beginning. Identity has been a battle. All these generations later, we still share the same breath of life that God gave to Adam. We still carry the image of God, but we wrestle with what defines who we are. When Jesus came into the world, this was the moment that God really set as the moment that he would help us clearly understand the core of our, our identity. In John 15, 5, Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And Jesus is telling us there that he is the core of who we are. Branches cannot exist without the vine. Branches are useless without purpose. But when we remain in Jesus and Jesus remains in us, what happens is everything clicks. We bear fruit as the scripture says, which is the purpose for which we were created, to live out the characteristics of God. This is what Jesus means by fruit, by the way, that we would be like him. When we're connected to the vine, when we live out our true identity as children of God, when we let Christ be the center of who we are, then how we live and how we act becomes a witness to the God who is at the core of our being. And this is what we mean by identity. We believe in Jesus, and so we are defined by Jesus. I'm not defined by my sexuality. I'm not defined by my mistakes. I'm not defined by the abuse that I experienced or by my family of origin or by my abilities or my failures. So many people let things like success define who they are. They present themselves to the world with an identity that they have created. But what Paul is trying to tell us is that when we build our identity on our success, we're telling God that we can handle things for ourselves. And this identity that we create out of our abilities, it actually gets in the way of depending on God and making him the center of our lives. Same is true of our failures. There's a persistent belief among many people that what we do, that what, what they have done in their lives makes them unlovable. It makes them unworthy. And they let that stand as a barrier, never approaching God because they believe that God wouldn't want them. 
How often do we let ourselves to be defined as lost when the truth is that Jesus came specifically to find and to save the lost? Make no mistake, this isn't just people who are outside the church. Christians do this as well. We believe in Jesus, but we find ways not to let him be the center of who we are. So fast forward to the end of Ephesians. We find ourselves in a topic uh, that we've been studying now for several weeks. We've been looking at this topic of spiritual warfare. The fact that we, there is an unseen battle that's going on all around us. It's unseen, it's invisible, but it's very real. This battle has been raging since the time of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. When the serpent, who is the enemy of God, whispered to Eve. And so doubt and confusion about God's promises and God's rules. And we have to be aware of this battle. We can't ignore it. We can't pretend that it doesn't exist because if we ignore it or we dismiss it, we play right into the enemy's hands. We let him gain the high ground because he wants us to act like there is nothing going on. He wants us not to pay attention to what's battling all around us. How many of you are familiar with C.S. Lewis? Any of you ever read the screw tape letters? No? If you have not read the screw tape letters, you need to get a hold of that book and read it. It's not very big. It's smaller than your Bible. Okay. It's only about 120 pages or so. It's not a big book, but it is a dialogue between two of Satan's demons, a senior demon by the name of screw tape and his young nephew and apprentice Wormwood. And throughout this book, This senior demon, this screw tape, is counseling his young nephew and how to properly approach humanity. This is considered a satire, but uh, throughout the whole thing, C.S. Lewis is making a comment, a, a running commentary on what it is that draws humanity away from God. So as screw tape counsels Wormwood in dealing with his patient, this human soul that Wormwood's expected to uh, lead astray. In one of the moments of counsel, Screwtape says to him, he says, I, the devil, they call, C.S. Lewis calls the demons devils. And he says, I, the devil, will always see to it that there are bad people. Your job, my dear Wormwood, is to provide me with people who do not care. What C.S. Lewis is saying here is he's saying through this dialogue between these two demons that one of the greatest tools of the enemy is to not get is to get us to not care that he exists to get us to not care that there's a battle going on lewis is reminding us that our enemy is an enemy of distraction and confusion and his job is to convince us that we don't know what we think we know and that even if we know we shouldn't care we ignore the unseen battle the enemy wins this is why paul addresses it so bluntly and so clearly at the end of ephesians The very battle for our identity is raging just out of sight all around us. And we are the battleground. The enemy fights for our souls. And he'll use every trick to seduce us away. And Paul tells us that we can't be ignorant of this because if we are, we fall into the hands of the devil. We commit the same sins that Adam and Eve committed in the Garden of Eden. And we allow ourselves to be distracted away. Our final passage in Ephesians, Paul brings up a final topic that is really key to dealing with spiritual warfare, to being successful in the midst of this battle that's going on around us. Last week, we talked about the armor of God that we are called to put on, and I'm not sure that put on is the best way of explaining it, because put on seems like it's something that I pick up and I put on myself. But this armor that God gives us isn't just armor that God creates. It is God's own armor that he gives to us. And really, a better way of saying put on should be receive. Allow God to put it on you. Do not be opposed to the armor that God wants to equip you with so that you are prepared in the midst of this battle. And that's what we talked about last week. But this week, Paul talks about the part that we get to do, the part that we have where we are involved in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 18 through 20. He finishes and he says, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me, Paul, 
that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare fearlessly as I should. So Paul concludes this discussion on spiritual warfare by telling us to do what? He tells us to pray. He tells us to get out there and to pray in all circumstances and in all situations. And I have to wonder, it it causes me to think a little bit, how do we treat prayer? The Bible makes numerous references to the importance of prayer, to the importance of it for our lives. But the question that I have, and the one that I would ask each and every one of you, is how much of your life is devoted to prayer? I've known some of you for quite a while, and I know some of you who are incredible prayer warriors and spend a significant amount of your time in prayer. But I think for a lot of us in the church as a whole, prayer is something we know is important, but I have to wonder at times how much of our lives are devoted to it. I'm not saying that we're walking around spending all day in prayer, but how much time do we truly devote to prayer connecting with God through it. I approach this topic with a fair amount of humility because as a pastor, I think it's expected that I should be really good at all things of faith. But I have to confess, I struggle with prayer. Not because I don't think it's important, not because I don't see the value in it, but because for some reason, for some reason, it's an area that I struggle with making it a regular part of my life. I'm used to getting in on Uh, in on Sundays in church, and we pray in church. You know, I'm used to times when I find myself in moments of need, taking time out to pray, and I think that's true for a lot of people. We get to the point where we have something where we need, or we're in the middle of a struggle, or we we have something that is affecting our lives in some way, and in that moment where we go, gosh, I just can't handle this on my own, that's when we turn to God in prayer. But Paul is telling us that in the midst of this unseen battle that's going on, we can't let prayer be the thing that we do when we reach the point where we can't do things on our own. But instead, prayer should be part of our regular lives. It should be something that characterizes our waking up and our going to sleep in the middle of our days that we are in this communication with God because prayer is not simply about bringing our needs to God. Prayer is not about just trying to let God know what's what's going on and what we need from him because God already knows. Prayer is not something that God needs from us. But prayer is something that we do because we need it. We need it so that we are connected to God. It puts us in this place of a proper relationship with our Lord. When we come to God in prayer, we are immediately saying that we are not enough. And what Paul's telling us is we need to do this more often than just when we recognize a specific need that we have. He says, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions and with all kinds of prayers and requests. And I had to think about that for a little bit and go, what does he mean by all occasions and what does he mean by all kinds of prayers? And so I think about my own prayer life and I go, how often are my prayers characterized by things that I need? Right? I've run up against a wall. I don't know what to do. I don't don't have the solution to the predicament or the situation that I'm in, so I turn to God. Okay, that's one of the places that we are invited to pray, but that's certainly not all occasions. When a great moment happens in my life, when something amazing comes around or I've got a big celebration, is that a moment? to turn to God in prayer? Is that one of those all occasions? And do I come to God with thanksgiving on my lips and say, thank you, God, for what you have worked out in my life? Is that one of those all occasions and all kinds of prayers? What about talking to God through my day? Talking to him about what's going on. Because you know what prayer does for us is it connects us to our Father. The good thing, the good news that we have through the gospel, the the good news that we, we understand from Scripture is that our God is not distant. The church in Ephesus 
was familiar with all of the Roman and Greek religions that surrounded them. They were used to gods who were in the shape of idols and statues. They were used to praying to inanimate objects. They were used to gods who in their own mythology were at best capricious and uncaring. They were used to having to make extraordinary sacrifices and jump through incredible hurdles to get their God to listen. Our God is different. Our God has promised that when we pray, he will hear us. That when we talk to him, he will will listen to what's going on. That when we ask of him, he will answer. And when Paul talks about all occasions and all kinds of prayers and requests, what he's saying is, don't wait until you don't have any other option but to pray. Because this is how you connect to God. In the midst of this unseen war that we are in the middle of, This is how we remain connected to the only one who can guide us and lead us through it and protect us. This is how we remain connected to the one who isn't fighting the battle for victory, but has already won it. Paul goes on, he says, with this in mind, praying on all occasions and all kinds of prayers and requests, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. And so what he does is he invites us and he challenges us not just to focus on ourselves in our own prayers. For many of you, I know that you spend a lot of time praying for other people. Some of you have lists of people that you pray for, and I imagine that that list grows more than it shrinks. But how often do we fall into the trap of just praying when we have a need? Paul says they'll be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people as well because this gives us a heart of compassion for those who are in need. It causes us to look towards the needs of other people. This takes us back to submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. When we pray for someone else, we are submitting to them. We are praying for their needs. We are lifting them up. We are looking out for what is going on in their lives. Paul then also asks for prayer for himself. And I love what Paul asked for. He says, pray also for me that whenever I speak, words would be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. And I love what's going on here because if you know anything about Paul's life at the time that he writes the letter to the Ephesians, Paul is literally in chains. He is in Rome. He is a prisoner He is chained to a Roman guard day and night. So it's not like he was just put into a cell and the door was locked. He is actually chained to another person day and night. Now, if this were me and I were focused on praying for myself and for my needs, I think my prayer, my request for prayer from the church in Ephesus would be, pray that I receive my freedom. Pray that something comes along to strike these chains off and let me out of jail. But that isn't what Paul prays for. What does Paul pray for? He prays for himself, but not because of himself. He says, pray also for me that whenever I speak words, I speak, words may be given me so that I will what? Fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Paul prays for his mission. He he asks for the Ephesians to pray that he would fearlessly be a witness for God. That even chained up to a Roman soldier, even stuck in prison, he would still have the opportunity to fearlessly proclaim, not just declare the word of God, but to do it without fear, without shame, without any sort of restriction on his message on the message of the good news. In all of this, Paul is encouraging us to make prayer part of our lives. Because in the unseen battle, there are things going on around us that we can't see and 
Not only are we called to be like Paul and be witnesses of the gospel, but we are also called to be aware of what's happening around us. And I wanted to conclude today with a story that out of 2 Kings, it's an account from the prophet Elisha. If you remember Elisha, he was the successor to the prophet Elijah during the, uh, during the time of the kings of Israel. Uh, this is in the Old Testament time. And Israel at this time is engaged in a battle. And if you know anything about the Old Testament, if you understand and you read the Old Testament through the eyes of Christ, that's one of the questions that we're always called to ask, right? What does this say about Jesus? And the Old Testament is meant as God interacts with this nation that he is creating, this nation of Israel that he is building. What God is doing through all of this is he is giving us a picture of his kingdom. That the, the earthly kingdom that is built out of Israel, this chosen nation separated out from the other, from the other nations, is a picture of the people of God, the followers of Christ, as a nation separate from the rest of the world. And so when Israel goes into battle in the Old Testament, it speaks of the unseen battle that goes on in the world, or that goes on outside of what we can see. The, the battles that Israel faces are meant to speak to the, uh, to the ongoing battle of God and his followers against the enemies of God. And so in this event, Israel is at war with the nation of Aram. And the armies have been surrounded by the Aramites. And 2 Kings chapter 6 says, When the servant of the man of God, so this is the servant of Elisha, got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. You can almost imagine how this servant must have felt. I mean, the terror and the fear in this moment. We're going to lose, is what he thinks. We are overwhelmed. There are not enough soldiers in Israel to defeat the enemy that have come against them. And very much in this moment as we look at this, this is the same feeling, I think, that comes upon us when we truly grasp the spiritual war that we are in is this feeling of there are so many enemies who are arrayed against us. And oftentimes we see those enemies just in the physical world around us. There are so many who are arrayed against us, so many who are coming, who are opposed to faith, who are opposed to Jesus, who are opposed to the church. There's so many enemies that we are going to be overwhelmed. We're not going to have the, we're going to lose, we're going to lose everything. And that's what this servant sees. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. And he says, oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. And Elisha responds, I love this. He says, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And the servant of the prophet Elisha is looking around and going, what are you talking about? The soldiers of Israel are few in number compared to the nation of Aram who has surrounded the city. And here's Elisha saying, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Any of you read this story? You know where this goes? And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. And then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. What an incredible moment that is. Where this servant who was terrified that he was about to be overwhelmed had his eyes opened and he saw the legions of God who were unnumbered. Through prayer, we not only connect to God, but God speaks to us. In prayer, when we are receptive and open to God returning, that this is a two-way conversation. God brings us the answers to our prayers. He brings us the peace and the comfort, and he brings us the sure knowledge that we are not alone, that we aren't in the middle of this battle trying to fight it on our own, that we are not striving for victory, but instead, just like the servant of Elisha, 
it is revealed to us that the victory is already won. We can't be ignorant of the battle that's going on around us. We can't be ignorant of what's happening. We can't pretend that it doesn't exist. We can't be indifferent. Because when we are, we let the enemy win. But prayer strengthens our faith. Prayer connects us to God. Prayer puts us into a place where we are open to hearing back from God. I hear a lot of times when people are struggling with things or looking for a direction, the question is, I just wish God would speak to me. And the question that I have to ask, because I ask that question at times, I just say, well, wish God would just speak to me. The question I have to ask is, are you talking to God? Are you taking time to put yourself into a posture of prayer to seek God out and then be willing to hear from him in return? This battle that we face is not an impossible one. It's impossible for you and for me, but it's not impossible for God. In fact, it's already done. We just have to have the courage to trust that God is in control. Our identity is rooted in the faith that we have in Christ and the faith that we have is strengthened through our prayers to God. So I'm going to do, as we conclude this, is I'm going to pray. And I'm going to give you a moment in my prayer just to silently where you're at, offer up prayers of your own. And I would encourage you right now, if prayer is a regular part of your life, you already know what to do. You're comfortable getting right into it and praying to God. But if this is something that you have struggled with, I would invite you to take that 30-second window and just ask God to help you become better at prayer. Let's take a few moments and pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I give thanks for this message that you've given us. I thank you, Lord, for what you have shown us through this letter to the Ephesians. I thank you, Lord, for everything that we have learned about identity and about who we are as followers of your Son. I thank you, Lord, for uh, what you have shown us about the lives that we lead as a result of our faith. I thank you, Lord, as you have shown us how to submit to one another for their good, but because we love Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, for showing us first that this battle exists. And second, that we don't have to be afraid of it. And so, Lord, as we conclude with prayer, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be people of prayer. Lord, for those who are comfortable with prayer, Lord, I pray that you would just strengthen them further, that you would help them connect even deeper with you. For those, Lord, who struggle with prayer, I pray that you would help them to be people of prayer, to make prayer a part of their daily lives, that they would seek to connect with you, to receive that strengthening of their faith that comes only through that connection, through that, through that bond that they get through prayer. Lord, help us to be strong warriors of faith in the battle that you have already won. May we not be overwhelmed by the enemy, but instead, Lord, Help us to be victorious as you are victorious. And so, Lord, I take just a few minutes and offer up this time that your people may spend time in prayer to you. Into your hands, O Lord, we lift our prayers, trusting in your mercy and your grace. And according to your word and by your promises, Lord, you have promised to hear our prayers and to answer us. Lord, help us to hear from you and help us to become people of prayer. We lift this all up to you in Jesus' name.
And all God's children together said, Amen. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Lord, look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen. If you would like to stand, you may. If you'd like to stay seated, you may. We're going to sing one more song as we go out. ready to go out this morning. I have two things. Uh, first, I would like to uh, thank Devin specifically today. Devin, how long have you been with us? I don't know. Years. Years now. And for years, Devin has been telling me with a completely straight face that he doesn't uh, he doesn't do cajon, which is that thing he's sitting on. It's completely straight face. Now, I don't do percussion. I play drums. And uh, Devin, two weeks ago, confessed. He's like, you know, I can do cajon. So uh, we didn't just grab it to say, hey, Devin's now confessed, and that's where you're sitting. But in, in this environment, in our picnic, we are so grateful that uh, <laughs> Devin for finally fessing up and being willing to step into that so that uh, it makes our setup a little bit simpler for this. Uh, in addition, uh, so thank you, Devin, for that, by the way. Thanks for stepping up. Um, uh, in a couple of weeks, we are going to have a brief congregational meeting after service. Did we pick an actual date? I think it ought to be the week after the week after the picnic, because that week we're going to be outside again. So let's say that would be the 13th, the 20th of August. 
We're going to have a brief one because we need to make some officers of the board changes. Uh, we had uh, we had had um, kind of a setup, uh, and we are going to be making some changes. Uh, Mike was uh, waiting for uh, Paul Priggy to be back on both his feet, um, and Paul has agreed to relieve Mike as chair, and Mike is going to step back to vice chair. Um, and uh, Matt had come in as uh, treasurer, but in conversation with Ron, Ron is going to actually go back to being treasurer, and we're going to bring Matt on in another spot, and we may have one other change as well. So we've got a few votes to do. That's all we're going to be doing, so that'll be on the 20th after worship. Uh, last thing, if you can help us strike this, this would be great. We've got a cart for these chairs we brought out of the auditorium where you get all the canopies down, get stuff out. There are still donuts over there, still coffee. Uh, go enjoy that. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.